The War of the Rebellion changed the thinking of the United States regarding battlefields and public memory. For the first time in the country's history, the government decided to take land out of private hands and turn it into commemorative landscapes that honored the veterans who had fought on those fields. However, this was a costly enterprise, too costly to do all the major battlefields of the war. As a result, the government very quickly adopted a preservation on the cheap approach, symbolized by what has become known as the Antietam Plan. Prior to the War of the Rebellion, the United States had not engaged in any major preservation efforts of the previous wars and only done a small number of battlefield monuments to honor the soldiers who had fought and died in previous battles. The centennial commemorations of the American Revolution brought a few more obelisks to battlefields of the Revolutionary War, but it was limited efforts that did not preserve the entirety of a battlefield. While in the western parts of the country, the first national park emerged in Yellowstone, the land transition there was within the federal domain, as the national park land was previously a national forest. Of course, for the War of the Rebellion, there were already the massive national cemeteries in direct vicinity of the battlefields that served as a visual reminder of what had transpired in the region. In addition, especially Gettysburg, became a place where states and veterans started to purchase small parcels of land to erect monuments to remember their heroic actions. It was only a short, ten-year impulse that witnessed Congress establish a handful of preserved battlefield parks. This was not without challenge, as the United States had never before turned private into public land, and was unclear if it was legally possible. Some landowners had taken the government to court over the condemnation of their land for use in the parks. In 1896, the Supreme Court agreed with the government that condemnation for preservation was legal. As early as 1887, regimental monuments appeared on the Antietam battlefield, in this case commemorating the 51st Pennsylvania at Burnside Bridge. The monument jumpstarts a conversation about Antietam's preservation and the creation of the Antietam Memorial Association. The association hoped to replicate the accomplishments of Gettysburg, but failed to do so. But they were able to create Antietam as the second preserved park after Chickamauga Chattanooga as a result of an 1890 spending bill. However, the bill did not support the preservation of Antietam on the same massive scale as the Chickamauga plan. Instead, Congress unintentionally supported a money-saving plan that acquired only a small amount of land. The War Department all of a sudden had to create two parks, but delayed work on Antietam until July 1891, when Secretary of War Redfield Proctor appointed John C. Stearns, formerly of the 9th Vermont Infantry, and Henry Heath of the Army of Northern Virginia as agents to organize the park their work was complicated by debilitating illness and the changed landscape over the last 30 years. 
The first task was to locate the battle lines, which I did with wooden markers. But tourists and local farmers often removed and destroyed these, forcing the two to use more substantial markers. By June 1892, the rebel army lines were mapped, and by the next year, those of the U.S. Army. Sadly, reports were too sketchy to locate the movement of individual regiments, and the two men settled on recording the movements and positions of individual divisions. As plans for the land purchases materialized, new challenges emerged with landowners unwilling to sell, hoping for a fairer price as a result of condemnation. Even more, landowners were reluctant to sell small parcels of land. They wanted to sell all or nothing. Change in government brought Daniel S. Lamont to the head of the War Department. He wanted a speedy conclusion of the work at Antietam, bringing about the resignation of Stearns. Heath reported that the battle lines were done and maps being drawn. In October 1894, Lamont reorganized the Antietam board, adding the longtime promoter of the park, Ezra A. Carmen, formerly colonel of the Surtees, New Jersey, at Antietam, Major George B. Davis from the War Department to the board. With Lamont, the War Department became more hands-on in the preservation process. The initial focus was on the creation of an accurate map of the events of September 17, 1862. However, there were issues and delays that eventually resulted in the cartographer getting fired. Despite the mapping issues, the board continued to purchase land and place tablets around the park for interpretation. The board considered it important to construct some roads to connect the various turnpikes leading into Sharpsburg, so visitors did not have to return to town every time they changed location on the battlefield. The creation of the four proposed roads would make the entire battlefield accessible. Bloody Lane was the first road, but local landowners were reluctant to sell. Similarly, the board determined to not put their road in the Bloody Lane, to not destroy the historic location. The government initially offered $50 an acre, going up to $100 an acre. If the landowner refused, the government instituted condemnation proceedings. Once the government had obtained the land, the board directed wire fences with gates so farmers could get to their land, but so too could visitors reach the locations of interest. Adding to the road dilemma, the government also needed to obtain permission from road owners to allow guests to use them. By April 1895, the board had all the permissions and land purchased. They also had a large number of individuals ready to help with the placement of tablets around the park. The board would have liked to erect two observation towers, one at Bloody Lane, which was actually built, and another one on the southern part of the battlefield. In addition, there were small stone bridges and culverts the board had built. Marking positions where officers had fallen, the board used upside-down cannon barrels. There was the idea to also place cannons and carriages, but despite having 36 cannons, there was no money for carriages. The board contacted states about placing monuments. By August 1895, federal money was drying up, and with little fanfare, the park opened in September. With that, Antietam had come into existence, but the park was small, with very little land actually preserved. This preservation on the cheap became the go-to for other future park projects, in many cases with devastating consequences for the historic battlefields in the future. Antietam was lucky that urbanization and urban sprawl never reached this region, but other parks were not. Thank you for watching this episode of the War of the Rebellion channel. If you liked the material covered, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell for new episodes. If there's a story of the War of the Rebellion you would like covered, please leave a comment. Use the comments to engage in conversations. Thank you for patronizing the War of the Rebellion channel.